In the middle of the New Mexico desert, people are vanishing, their homes and businesses destroyed. One little girl is found roaming the dusty landscape under such a state of shock she can only shout, Bam! The local police sergeant, Ben Peterson, invites the FBI to help unravel the mystery, but FBI agent Robert Graham is just as perplexed as anyone else. That is, until the arrival of myrmecologists Harold and Patricia Medford, who finally reveal the source of this new affliction. Carpenter ants that have grown to tremendous size by nuclear radiation and turned carnivorous in order to satiate their gargantuan appetites. Working with the United States military, Peterson, Graham, and the scientists manage to exterminate the nest, but it is too late, as queens have hatched and taken flight across the country to build new nests from which to spread their horror, with one making its home beneath the bustling city of Los Angeles. Before we get started, please hit that like button, and if you do like this video, make sure to subscribe to see more. I'm still just getting started with this channel, and I could really use your support to break through the underground tunnels of YouTube obscurity, so thank you in advance. With that out of the way, let's get back to the subject at hand. When he first heard the news about the bombing of Hiroshima in 1945, one of General Douglas MacArthur's staff officers, a radio advisor named Ted Sherdeman, immediately began throwing up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> From that point on, he was vehemently opposed to the nuclear bomb, and when he entered civilian life as a Hollywood staff producer not long after that, he began looking for ways to tell the world about it. Meanwhile, popular plant seed peddlers like W. Atlee Burpee and Company were selling specialty seeds that had been bombarded with x-rays. They grew into spectacularly mutated flowers several times larger than average. In the early 50s, Sherdeman, inspired by these monster perennials, commissioned from screenwriter George Worthington Yates a story about giant ants irradiated by nuclear testing. Yates had built a career writing for serials like The Lone Ranger, and his story, simply called Them, was a series of diary entries about giant ants menacing the New York City subways. Sherdeman had Yates attempt to adapt the story into a screenplay, but the script Yates delivered proved to be far too expensive, so Sherdeman turned to screenwriter Russell Hughes for a second shot. Hughes only got through between 20 and 50 pages before Sherdeman himself took over and finished it with the help of the film's eventual director, Gordon Douglas, famous at the time for adventure films like The Black Arrow and Fortunes of Captain Blood. This new version of the story started in the New Mexico desert as a slow-burning mystery that evolves into a creature feature with a climax on the Santa Monica Pier, though the climax was later changed to the far less expensive to shoot at Los Angeles storm drains. Even though Warner Brothers had put several tens of thousands of dollars into the script development and commissioned a film test involving a three-foot ant head, studio head Jack L. Warner wasn't enthusiastic about the project. Rather than giving it the go-ahead then, Warner offered the project to rival studio 20th Century Fox, who were all too eager to offer an exorbitant sum for it after the financial success of Warner Brothers' own The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. The offer was so high, in fact, that it convinced Warner to reconsider the value of what he had so he retracted the offer and gave the project back to producer Ted Sherdeman. With Gordon Douglas already set to direct, Sherdeman then turned to casting. Douglas had originally envisioned turning the script into a vehicle for Jerry Lewis and Dean Martin, but Sherdeman was convinced the film would work better with a serious, dramatic cast. For the lead role of Police Sergeant Ben Peterson, he chose James Whitmore, known then for roles in The Asphalt Jungle and Battleground, but better known now as Brooks Hatland from The Shawshank Redemption. That's nice and ripe. To play the FBI agent who fights the ants alongside him, Robert Graham, he hired James Arness, the titular thing from another world who would later go on to star in Gunsmoke. For the female lead, Dr. Patricia Medford, Sherdman turned to opera singer turned movie star Joan Weldon, and for her father, Dr. Harold Medford, he had to work hard to convince the studio to let him tap Miracle on 34th Street's Edmund Gwen, who many thought was too old. Small roles were given to Onslow Stevens, Olin Howlin, a young Leonard Nimoy, and Fess Parker. Walt Disney screened them when looking for an actor to play Davy Crockett, as he was strongly considering James Arness at the time. However, Fess Parker's one-scene performance was so good, Disney would go on to hire him instead. It probably didn't hurt that Parker was less expensive. With filming only two weeks away, the studio butted heads with Sherdeman. Warner Brothers, eager to compete with Universal's Creature from the Black Lagoon, was keen to shoot the film in color and in 3D, 
which had become all the rage following the hit B-movie Buona Devil. Sherman, however, envisioned using real ants in black and white, made large with photographic effects and only minimal model work. Unable to reconcile these creative differences, Warner Brothers fired Sherman and gave the producer role to David Weisbert, an editor who had recently become the youngest producer in the company's history. With Sherman out and the new studio mandates in, Douglas and Weisbert prepared the film to be made in full-color 3D, which required the creation of full-sized ant models. Only two complete ants were built, alongside a handful of partials. The models reportedly looked great in color, with a dark purple sheen on their bodies and green and red soap bubbles in their eyes, and the effects team got them to move through a combination of internal levers and carefully aimed high-powered fans. However, with less than two days left before cameras would roll, the studio changed course yet again, slashed the budget, and told Douglas to use black and white film. The change was so dramatic, he couldn't even use widescreen. Douglas begrudgingly did as he was told, even shooting scenes that were specifically designed for 3D with his 2D cameras, like this scene in which flamethrowers are fired directly at the camera. By the way, those are real flamethrowers being wielded by real military flamethrower operators. Even though the entire movie was filmed in black and white, an Eastman color title card was still spliced into every release print, a single lasting testament to what could have been. Neither audiences nor critics seemed to notice the -the behind-the-scenes drama, though, and after the film debuted in June of 1954, it became a smash hit, with a domestic box office of $2.2 million and widespread critical acclaim. It was Warner Brothers' most successful film of the year, and was nominated for an Academy Award for Special Effects, ultimately losing out to Walt Disney's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and its giant squid. While it shouldn't be credited as Hollywood's first anti-nuclear giant monster movie, that honor belongs to the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, it did launch the oversized insect craze that would scurry through the sci-fi cinema scene for several years, with films like Tarantula, The Black Scorpion, and The Deadly Mantis all trying to capitalize on its success. Its anti-nuclear message is also much clearer than its predecessor, with Dr. Medford's final lines of dialogue making it abundantly clear what Ted Sherman thought about the nuclear bomb how he feared the world would be forever changed in ways nobody fully understood. When man entered the atomic age, he opened a door into a new world. What we'll eventually find in that new world, nobody can predict. This movie works not just because of its potent message, though. It's also an intelligently crafted thriller that begins with a strong sense of dread and mystery that slowly morphs into something with enormous stakes. It starts with a little girl in shock roaming the desert, and it climaxes with a distraught mother whose husband has died and whose two boys are missing in the monsters' underground lair. As a result, this isn't just frivolous popcorn entertainment. While there are bits of humor sprinkled throughout to keep things light, the film always treats its subject matter with seriousness, never once devolving into the kind of self-parody that would define its imitators. Even though it's built on a premise that makes no true biological sense, it tries to imagine how a colony of giant ants would actually work and behave. After the characters find the first nest a third of the way through the movie, the next scene plays out like a careful thought experiment, sticking to the inherent difficulties destroying a colony of gigantic ants would actually present. It's also worth noting that, for the general public at least, it did seem like radiation could do just about anything. After all, people were planting marigolds nearly a foot across made possible by x-rays, so for most people, giant ants weren't that ridiculous. And that's all for today, my fellow Earthlings. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And if you really do like what I'm doing here, consider checking out my Patreon, where you can get early access, bonus videos, your name in the credits, and much more. You can also find written reviews of many other classics of film and literature at my website at emcgill.com. Also, let me know in the comments below what you think is the best giant insect movie, and feel free to mention other sci-fi classics you'd like to see me tackle. Until next time, This is The Unapologetic Geek, telling you to never be ashamed of what you love, as long as you're not hurting anybody.
finished, say over and out. But she knows I'm through talking with her. I know she does, Doctor. It's a rule, though. You gotta say it. Isn't that right, General? Right, Sergeant. This is ridiculous. 